Hi, and welcome to the second part of this three-part series. If you skipped the first one because you knew it, great. These are distinct sections. If not, consider going back because you'll learn stuff in the first section too. In this section, Jeff tells us how to save thousands of dollars over time as an American by working through a process of stepping up our basis of taxation using our brokerage account investments so that if and when we return to the United States, we're able to withdraw more money each year tax-free. This episode was recorded on December 12th, 2022. Enjoy. What I'm excited about now is the next part where Jeff's going to talk about your earning interest, your earning dividends, you've maybe got some capital gains. How can you take advantage of that and using some of the levers that you're talking about? So let's go for that. Yeah, great question, David. You know, let me say from the outset, if some of your listeners are still stateside, and you have the ability to open up a brokerage account through a company like Vanguard or Schwab or TD Ameritrade or other investment companies that are out there in the U.S. while you still have a residence in the U.S., I would really encourage you to set up those accounts. And the reason we want to do that is because many of these companies that I've mentioned, they don't provide services for expatriates. That is, it's really difficult to open an account once you're abroad. But if you're in the U.S. and you have the ability to establish these accounts prior to moving overseas, it's uh, for many, many expat Americans, it's something of a don't ask, don't tell sort of thing. Exactly. (laughs) Keep what you have within that account. You're not doing anything illegal. It's just a question of whether or not these brokerage firms want to serve you. There are some international firms out there that do provide services for expat Americans to be able to invest internationally. And you can find some of those online, as well as just do a shameless plug for Andrew's page on Facebook there, where he talks a lot about different companies that are available. And you can reach out to that Facebook group and find information on these different companies that are out there. But what I want people to understand with our tax code, as as strange as it sounds, is there's actually two different tax codes at work. One for earned income and one for unearned income. And Audrey and David, I remember when I learned this for the first time, I was in the weight room on a Sunday afternoon up at school working out, right? So I'm, here I am nerding out, listening to a podcast with the gym lights half off and hearing this guy being interviewed on this podcast, Choose FI, Choose Financial Independence. His name is Jeremy and his wife is Winnie. And they have a blog called Go Curry Cracker kind of a weird name, right? Go Curry Cracker. (laughs) And and the the article that he had written was entitled Never Pay Taxes Again. And these two guys, one of them is a CPA, they're interviewing Jeremy and he's explaining this process that I'm going to explain to you. And like those folks that were listening to this and asking him questions, my jaw dropped. I never knew that there were two different tax (laughs) systems And I never knew that it could be possible for an American expat to be in a situation where possibly they could come back to the United States and not have to pay any taxes on their unearned income. And so what I want people to understand is that there's actually two different tax systems that are at work. One for the money that you earn, and earned income would be things like the salary from your job, any kind of professional fees, consulting work, tutoring that you might do, which is a very popular one among international teachers. If you have a side business that you're running, all of this is considered earned types of income. On earned income, there's a different tax system for that. Now, as expat Americans, we can exclude much of that earned income with the foreign earned income exclusion. And that's a really good thing. So we end up not having to pay taxes on that money while we're overseas. But if you were in the US and you made $100,000 working, you would have earned income. But let's say now you had $100,000 inside a brokerage account. And for those listeners out there who might not be aware of this, a brokerage account is basically an account inside of a company fund like a Vanguard or Schwab. 
And in that, you can buy different types of funds, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds. And what happens is as that money grows, there is a profit that could potentially be realized. When you sell that particular stock or that index fund, you have to do what's called realizing a gain. So let's say I bought a stock for $50 and it grew to $100. I'm not going to have to pay taxes on the $50 that I put into it, but I will have to pay taxes on the $50 that gained. But the tax code for that is different because it's considered unearned income versus earned income. And depending on how much total earned income you have, that amount could be $0, it could be 15%, or it could be 20% as the current tax code is set up. So for earned income for 2023, for example, the tax brackets are 10%, 12%, 22 24 32 Most people don't know that when you pay taxes, you're paying different amounts at different bands for the amount of income that you have. So for example, if you made $95,000, even though that last dollar may be in the 24% bracket, you're not paying 24% taxes for all of it. You're paying a portion of that. Just on the $1, right? That's right. That's right. And anything else that's within that band. A lot of people don't realize that. So when I offer some of these classes for faculty, we just do a simple exercise showing them what the difference between earned and unearned income is just to try to help them see the difference in that. So for example, if you had $95,000 in unearned income and you had no other income, how much would you pay in taxes? The answer is $0 because the way the tax code is set up is unearned income is taxed differently than earned income. And this is a super important concept for people to realize. For example, let's just say hypothetically, you're an American teacher and you've done the work You've done the diligence of planning and preparing for yourself, and you have $1.5 million in a brokerage account. Okay, Of that $1.5 million, let's say $750,000 is money that you put in over the years. So that's your basis. The other $750,000 is unearned income. So you got $1.5 million in this account. Now you're repatriating back to the U.S., and you don't have any other source of income. You don't have a pension waiting for you. You have very little, if anything, in Social Security, and you need $50,000 a year to live on. You're married, filing jointly. $50,000 a year, you're going to pull from that brokerage account. Well, as a married couple filing jointly, you can take almost $120,000 a year if you wanted to out of that account, and you would pay $0 in taxes. So If I just go over these bandwidths for you for the long-term capital gains brackets, for example, the 0% bracket for singles is $44,625. The 0% bracket for married filing jointly for 2023 is $89,250. And for head of household, it's $59,750. But you also get your standard deduction. So you would add your standard deduction onto that. So for married filing jointly, it would be 89250 plus $27,700. So you mm-hmm. could conceivably take up to hundred, close to $120,000 out of your brokerage account every year, and your taxes for that would be $0. If that were earned income, if we flip that around and that was earned income instead, you would be paying close to $20,000 plus in taxes on that. This is the power of being able to really understand how taxation works for earned versus unearned income. Hmm. Okay, so I'm glad you paused because uh, definitely needing to process (laughs) that idea. When people hear this for the first time, it's a mind bender. Yeah. Because there are concepts that you're being exposed to that are foreign in terms of the language that's being used. There are ideas that you're kind of sort of familiar with, but you don't fully understand or appreciate the nuances until you maybe actually see them and have some more conversations with people. But like myself on this journey, this spurred me on to want to find an article, a book, Mm -hmm. a conversation to be had, a podcast, an email to send to someone. 
And that's the part that I want teachers to start getting involved in is realize you may not have all the answers, but there are pieces that you can start to put together to form your own puzzle to figure out what that looks like for you. Yeah. Knowing you don't have all the answers is really the key. Absolutely. Because it's very easy to come complacent and think, okay, well, we've just got that exclusion. And so we're not paying taxes and we just invest what we have versus a more strategic way of claiming it, but then being excluded for it and being above that excluded amount of the foreign exclusion with the housing exclusion and the child and all of the other pieces that that becomes the part that you can then squirrel away basically, right? And not pay taxes on, yeah. That's right. And so it gets even better than that. I know there's another layer like, oh, Devin's, here we go. But there's- The icing on the cake, are you serious? The the icing on the cake is like, even though you're not, you're filing those taxes every year and it keeps coming back, oh, no taxes, no taxes, no taxes. Going back to those kids. So, you know, if you think about your children, if they're below the age of 17, there's a $4,000 credit. That $4,000 credit is actually worth about $25,000 in harvested gains in your brokerage account. So what we've been doing the last several years, Audrey, is we've actually been creating taxable events and telling the IRS to go ahead and tax us. And then what we do is we turn around and use our child tax credits to wipe out that tax legally And we reset the basis of that stock. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So let's say we buy an index fund for $25,000. We pay $25,000 for it, and it's now growing to $50,000. Well, if we sell that stock, we have to pay tax on that $25,000 of growth. Instead, what we do while we're still living overseas is we take those child tax credits And we apply those to that tax. We sell that stock. We say to the IRS, hey, go ahead. You can tax us. That's fine. They tax us. We use our credits to offset that tax, effectively wipe it out. And we reset the basis of that index fund now to $50,000. Why do we do that? There's two reasons we do that. So that in retirement, we have less potential taxes to pay should the 0% tax bracket go away. And what people need to understand is that this bracket has not always been here. In 2026, the U.S. government is set to sunset our current tax code that we have and revert it back to the 2017 model. It's possible within that time, they could also move that 0% bracket to 10% or even higher. The other reason that we want to do this, and this is super important, is a lot of people don't realize that your earned income determines your health savings credits. Your earned income could potentially determine how much your social security is getting taxed on. But if my basis has all been stepped up to a large degree, in the eyes of the IRS, it looks like I make nothing. I remember listening to a podcaster talk about this. He said, you know what? In the eyes of the IRS, you need to look paper poor. What he means by this is we need to use these different tax levers and tax buckets to try to set up our accounts in such a way so that it looks like we're drawing off as little tax friction as possible. So that, for example, when you're 55 and you're trying to figure out how do I qualify for medical insurance between 55 and 65, well, the ACA premiums are available for a person. But lo and behold, the ACA premiums are based on your income. But if your income is close to zero, zero, <laughs> then you qualify for potentially twenty five, thirty thousand dollars of credits to help offset your insurance cost in early retirement until you get to the time when you might qualify for Medicare. And what differentiates Americans often from other passport holders that are international educators is that we have to file our taxes every year. We don't automatically get what's called a step up in basis on our investment. Let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say, for example, you're overseas and you started out with maybe $20,000 in an investment. And over the course of your 30 years, you continue to add money. You continue to receive 
compounding interest and dividends. And over the course of your 20 years, that $20,000 has grown into $1.6 million. And now you return back to your country of passport, for example, Canada. Well, once you arrive in Canada with that $1.6 million, that's going to be your determined basis. That is your starting point for determining taxations going forward. So now you've repatriated, you're living in Canada, and that $1.6 million, any gain on that from that point forward, you're going to be assessed a tax on that. For Americans, this is not the case. Every year we have to file our taxes and we have to account for any gains that we make if we realize those gains, that is, if we sell that particular investment and receive a return on our investment, we'll have to pay a tax on that. Most other countries around the world, passport holders, they're not liable for that. And so this is a really big distinctive feature of being an expat American and living abroad. So again, it's about learning these different pieces. I I wouldn't anticipate that anyone would get all of this. But what I hope is that there are different seeds along the way that are germinating for folks to what is that? How does that work? What's this question? That's exactly the process we need to be doing as educators to try to figure this out. Well, it's really nice to have somebody say, you know, essentially, as we often say as teachers, there are no stupid questions and just go ahead and ask and I'll explain it again in a different way or give a different example or what have you. So thank you for taking the time. It's, it's wonderful. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I'll jump in there on this one and kind of build that bridge with the tax preparer for folks. I think if they take the terminology that you were just talking about and sat down with their tax preparer and said, how can I keep raising my cost basis on this ETF, this index fund that's the S&P 500, that we can keep raising it because it's going to help us later with our ACA, Obamacare cost, and when we eventually retire and we start selling this index fund, we will have very low capital gains because we've raised that cost base. Just that much terminology, I think, will get the tax accounts to go, okay, yeah, let me unpack that for you a little bit and see where we can go. Absolutely. David, you're spot on with that. Spot on. The key is having just the few sentences that you had just said you have a level of knowledge about this that many of the teachers that I'm sharing this information are familiar with. And that script is something that I try to help teachers formulate with their CPA. You know, I just want to give a shout out. Unfortunately, our CPA is not accepting any more people, but Chad's his name. And and over the last 20 years, he's afforded me the opportunity to banter back and forth and ask questions as a learner and to be patient with me. And and if you're thinking about paying for the fees of a CPA, you want to find someone that's a teacher at heart, that they're they're not going to be intimidated or offended by your questions like, oh, you don't trust me or I know what I'm doing. No, we want to learn in this process. And so finding someone who can help you know, has kind of a, the heart of a, a teacher to be able to help you with this language is really, really important. And that's just a, such a big need. And by the way, I'll just throw a shout out there. The tax code is 66,000 pages. And there's this tiny little subsection that's built on for expats kind of attached to this, attached to that. Many CPAs, they don't know this stuff. It's not that they're not learners, not that they can't learn it, but they're just not familiar with this. I remember Chad saying to me just a few years ago, our CPA, as we're talking about doing this harvesting, he said, Jeff, you're doing this higher level jujitsu stuff that most of the people that I work with just don't do. Nice. And the reason they don't is they just don't have the levers to pull that expats have. Well, you were a wrestler back in college, so you're game, right? <laughs> That's it. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. That's, I think, really good advice that if you feel intimidated by the person that's supposed to be helping you with this stuff, or if they seem not to really be that familiar with the types of tax credits that you're talking about and the exclusions, maybe it's time to find somebody different. Mm. I think that's really good advice for people to think about. I think sometimes we get, like you said, intimidated. We feel like we don't understand it. And so we kind of put it in their hands and they may or may not have our best interests at heart. I was interested by your comment at the beginning that you think it may be intentional that it's murky for us and hard to understand. 
And, you know, I was wondering if you were maybe intimating that it's a job security situation for people who do this kind of work that if we don't understand it, we need them, right? And so I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but that's how I took that comment. And I think to your point about just learning just enough to know that you don't know, but that you know the questions to ask is really key. So thank you for putting it that way. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a few others I'll just put out there. You know, Audrey, as to your question about, you know, job security or something more nefarious, sadly, I'm a pessy optimist. If you ask my wife, she'll say that I have to look at things as worse as they could possibly be and then kind of work back from there and try to find the good and the positive in things. As I learn more about this field, internationally specifically, there are a lot of sharks There are people that are intentionally using language that is meant to confuse by design. And I really bristle at that because I think that while their goal may not be to harm, their goal is to make money. And uh, unfortunately, there are some people that have unscrupulous means by which they go about doing that. But what I also find is that if teachers can learn some of this language, and start to ask critical questions. Again, not cynical questions, but critical questions like, how does this work? Can you explain this to me? I don't get this. Can you break this down? Can you show me in a different way? I'm a teacher too, but I don't get this. If we can do that, be persistent about it, and and not in a mean or aggressive way, eventually we'll start to get to those answers. And uh, for some people, those answers might be quite unsettling once they realize what they were looking for is what they thought. But there are some others that are out there that are, you know, really trying to provide a service and support for people that's well-intentioned. You know, there's a, in the program that I'm involved with right now is uh, studying to become a CFP, a certified financial planner. One of the things that we talk about is having this responsibility known as a fiduciary role. Mm -hmm. And you will see this language spread out all the time. Fiduciary in its broadest sense means that my responsibility is to look out for your best interest. I need to put your interest in front of mine. But oftentimes you'll see people that act in the role of a fiduciary that are not exhibiting fiduciary behaviors or characteristics. And so, you know, it's really important to understand what it is that you're getting into in terms of relationships. I would say to you, if it doesn't make sense to you, if that person explaining a product to you can't make sense, you shouldn't be putting money into it. If they're telling you that I need to know by this Friday or this deal closes, let the deal close. Mm. Far better for you to keep that money in a checking account or savings account until you get the answers to the questions that you feel you need in order to be comfortable with taking those next steps. Don't be intimidated. Don't be bullied into putting that money into that particular account. Ask the questions and seek out the answers. As I said, I'm a learner. I acknowledge my ignorance and my desire to learn, and I'm confident that those who are hearing this podcast today will have nuances that they could add to this, and I hope you do. I want to be able to learn right alongside fellow teachers as I share this information out, and the more we do that, the better supported we're going to be. As I share this information with people, what I encourage them to do is please share this forward. And I often, you know what's really funny about this, uh, David and Audrey, is as I share this information with people, Initially, their thing is like, you can see it in them. They're looking at me like, is this guy has a Tupperware to sell to me? Is this an Amway pitch? Is there <laughs> yeah. something coming? Does he got some donuts he's going to put out here? And then eventually, I've got nothing to sell, folks. Yeah. I just have information to offer that I've learned. And the fear in me are those teachers back in Indonesia that I sat with. Right. The motivation in me is wanting to help international teachers recognize we have a responsibility yeah. I want to be as clear as I can without causing a microaggression, which, by the way, I was accused of several years back for sharing this information because wow. it caused panic for a teacher to hear this. Wow. There is no safety net. There is yeah. no safety net if you choose to live internationally. You have to do due diligence to understand yeah. what's going on. If you don't want that, as one teacher couple I met several years ago, they realized, hey, we can't do this so well. We need to get back to our country of passport where there's more of a socialized system. And we know we're going to be vested with that school district. And that's okay too. There's no shame in that. Jeff, 
I'm feeling very fortunate that as a young man, I had a job starting at the age of 10. And so when I get my Social Security printout of all my credits and things from the age of 10 until like 20, I always had a job. So I was able to get enough credits so that I will have Social Security when the day comes. But for a lot of international educators, Americans, that isn't the case. So there's that group that I just wonder, is there any way they can try to make up for lost time? And then I'm also wondering about that 25-year-old, again, American. She's starting overseas, and she wants to try to contribute a little to Social Security so she can get some credits. Could you cover both those topics? We're stopping the episode here to allow our listeners time to digest and reflect upon the material shared so far. Part three of this three-part bonus interview picks up with Jeff diving into healthcare options when one repatriates to the U.S., along with helpful insights about the U.S. Social Security and Medicare systems. Don't forget to check out Jeff's slideshow, which is linked in the show notes, to further your understanding of the topics covered in this episode. Thank you for joining us today on Educators Going Global. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other usual suspects. Please subscribe, like us, and leave a review on Apple and Spotify, and let your teaching friends know about us so we can grow our community. Please reach out at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com and join our Facebook group, Educators Going Global, if you have ideas, comments, or wish to share a going global story of your own. You can also find us on Instagram at Educators Going Global. Please visit our website as well, www.educatorsgoingglobal.com. All our podcast episodes are on there by topic, along with blog posts, going global stories and our ever-growing resource library for now this is audrey and david inviting you to travel teach and connect with us